My name is Marielle Voxep. Welcome to today's best practices session on recruiting for startups. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome today's speakers. Mario Laudi is the executive director of the Laudi Group. Did I get it right? You got it. Okay. Well <laughs> a successful executive research firm serving Ontario software companies. He's also the founder of Red Canary. Red Canary is an online community for individuals who are building their careers in the tech sector. His unique vision for talent is reflected in the CEOs, executives, and entrepreneurs that look to him for advice and perspective. And joining him today is Christina McDougall. Christina has spent over 15 years working with local software companies, delivering recruiting solutions and working as a sales rep and consultant. She leads the recruitment and executive searches for the Lottie Group, where she manages critical senior level searches for high growth tech clients. And it's her goal and passion to help the leaders of Canada's technology sector by connecting them with the talented individuals who will drive their success. So please welcome Christina and Mario. All right. So thanks for the introduction and, uh, and for the invitation to come and, and speak, to, uh, speak to you here at Mars. Uh, as you know, today we're going to talk about recruitment and more specifically selection. Um, so how do you find, not only how do you find, but how do you select the right people for your team? And what I'm hoping that we'll do today is give you some insights and an approach that's a little bit different than what you will see and read um, anywhere else. Because the companies that we work with are all tech companies and for the most part they're little tech companies like yourselves and we know that the challenges that you face um, and the issues that you have in building a team are unique. So while there's a lot of information about how, you know, how do you recruit like Google and Facebook, that might not um, resonate as much with you and, and those tips and tricks might not um, deliver the same impact to you because your, um, your experience in your business is quite different. So the big company approach is um, is really relevant when you have the ability to make mistakes and you have the ability for people to potentially to hide in places in the organization and deliver less than their full potential. But we know that your companies are small and, um, and you need to be innovative and your people need to be taking risks and they need to be operating at 100%. So go back earlier this year, we did some work with um, Charles Plant in Material Minds and, and some of you may know Charles from his work here at, at Mars. And Charles, uh, and, and we wanted to do some research, and we wanted to really understand how is our tech, com our tech sector doing when it comes to employee engagement? So what does that mean? Are your employees, are the employees in the tech sector really delivering 100%? Are they showing up and giving 100% to the, to the organization and, and to the company? Are they passionate? Are they inspired? Do they um, show up for work every day and really go the extra mile? And more importantly, do they, do they support and love the companies that they work for and, and do they do everything that they can to make those companies successful? And the results of that survey were a little shocking to me and maybe a little bit shocking to you as well. So one of the things that we found, um, so we surveyed individuals in the Ontario tech sector. So these are real employees working at tech companies of all sizes and um, across all functions in an organization. And what we found was that of all of those people, only about 23% would actively promote their employer as a good place to work. So only 23% of employees that work in our tech sector are telling their friends and people that they meet, you should come and work for my company, we're doing great things. Um, you know, and, and those are the people that are sort of rallying behind the message. The more shocking piece was that about 41% of people that are working in the tech sector are actively detracting people from their company. So they are telling people, don't come and work here. It's not a good place to be. Um, they either don't believe in the message of the company or they don't think that it's a good place to go to work every day. And yet they show up and deliver some, some sort of, of effort and, and take up a seat and, and certainly take a salary. And then the other 36% in the middle are, are indifferent. So they are neither... Um, detracting people or attracting people, but they, but they show up every day and probably go home at five o'clock or four o'clock. Um, so, so what does this mean and what do we, do, what do, we do with this data? Um, so as, as a larger organization, um, you may have the opportunity or the, the luxury to look at this and say, well, we have to deal with this and we have to understand that 
77% of our organization is not delivering 100%, so maybe we hire extra people so we can double our headcount because there's you know, people delivering only 50% of productivity, so let's make everybody more productive. Or not let's make everyone more, more productive, but let's add more people so that we get the same amount of productivity out of the organization. As a small company, you don't have the ability to do that because of the expense of doing that. And more importantly, the, the cost of having disengaged people in your workforce is not just that they're taking a salary and taking a seat, um, it's that they are not your innovators. So the people that are in that promoter section, they're engaged employees, are the people who are driving innovation. Um, if you're not showing up and giving 100%, that innovative piece is the first thing to fall off. So they're not innovating. They're not going the extra mile if they're in your customer service organization. They are not um, in a sales capacity going out of their way to find new opportunities. They're probably not taking any risks and they're really not the individuals who will um, get back up after failing for the 50th time. And as a startup organization, you need people who are really resilient and who really are going to pick themselves up after failure and keep going because they really believe in what you're doing. So as a startup, you know, we're not, uh, we're not really focused on how do we deal with that 77%. We really have to look at who are those people that are the engaged people? And how do we build our whole team, or most of our team, of those people? So the question that, that came out of this research for us, focused on the recruiting side of things, is can we identify those people who are the more engaged employees, who after a year or two are still coming to work every day and giving it 100%, who are still waking up in the middle of the night with a bright idea and writing it down and emailing somebody and doing something about it, can we see those people before we hire them? And you might think, yes, everyone's seeking to do that, but clearly there's not a lot of success in doing that, or only you know, one out of four times are we, are we really successful in doing that. So, so what we're looking to do today is to really focus on engagement and what are all of the things that drive engagement and how do we see those early in the process? And that's really what we look at as the art of selection. So our talk today is really, I'm going to focus on that process. So you have some people that you think are going to um, potentially want to come and work for you. How do you select the ones that in a year from now are going to be your promoters? So over to Mario for, you, a, is it? for a story. Yeah. We have stories. How many people here have heard of Empathica? I got one. Okay, so you're going to learn something. There's a really interesting company in Mississauga called Empathica. And Empathica does customer experience management. And what is that? Well, it's essentially, it's a solution, it's a suite of approaches to determine what customers think of various brands. So if you go to a Starbucks, or you go to Shoppers, or Canadian Tire, there's a, on your receipt, there's a little URL that you can click on, and you can go and you can take surveys, and you can tell the brand what you think of them. So the year is 2010, and I meet Simon Palmer. Simon comes back from the UK to Canada, and he's here to become the CTO of Empathica. And we sit down, we talk about how do we find really good software engineers. And I should point out, this poor company has an office in Mississauga. And if you're looking at a hotbed of software, it's not Mississauga. But that's a story for another day. The reality is, Simon says, I've got to build up a massive team. Mario, can you help us? Sure, that's what we do. So we collaborate and we create a format that was based on, anybody know who DHOC is? Okay, DHOC is the former CEO of Visa. You all have a Visa card? This guy is essentially the guru of hiring. If, if I could do anything retroactively, I wish I could have written his hierarchy of hiring. So think of Maslow, hierarchy of needs. Well, this is the other side. And we sat down and we created a format that looks a bit like that, whereby we would look at candidates in a completely different manner. We essentially drew a line here saying, we will not compromise on these things, but we will compromise on those things. And we'll get into the detail of that shortly. But the interesting, that the, the, the thing I want to share with you is all about engagement. Because in doing this, and then by including individuals from the team, in the selection process, 
we got dramatic engagement. So in the last three years, Empathica hired 19 people. The majority of them were software engineers, a couple were QA, a couple were senior product managers and user experience. But the moral of the story is that 19 people get hired in three years, only one is left. And when we look in, in, in retrospect, we see, I get it, the difference is all of the individuals who were gonna be affected by the new hire were involved in the selection process. And yes, we did go back to the hierarchy and we'll touch on that shortly. But the essence of the conversation is always bring the candidate in, let's not worry about the key SQL server or whatever buzzword is required. Let's see if the team can play and work with this individual. And by collaboratively, collaboratively selecting talent, we saw a tremendous uptick in how they hang on to people. I don't know if you know a lot about software companies, but turnover is insanely high. And for these guys to hold on to and lose essentially 5% of their team in three years is rather dramatic. Can you give me my next slide? So the moral of the story that we took from Empathico is that you've got to break your reliance on resumes and start reading people. And that collaborative selection process, when they sat down with three or four employees of Empathica, those candidates were put in a complete different context. And the context was, yeah, we're going to interview you briefly, but really, we're going to give you a little test. And that test won't take very long, but you're going to come back and you're going to present the test. And we're going to simulate what it's like to work here. We want to see, can you solve problems? Can you collaborate with people? Can you ask questions? Can you take feedback? And essentially, all of the things you need in a small company come down to who the person is rather than what the resume is. And the fascinating thing for us is that we are constantly being asked for amazing resumes, but over time we've seen a recurring theme that resumes are these phenomenal, I don't know, they're fortresses around the, uh, around the candidates. And the challenge is to peel back the resume and get to know the human because when you do that, you start acquiring a whole other set of skills that you will never be able to train. You might be able to train SQL Server, or you might be able to train pragmatic marketing, but you can't change the human attributes that make small companies successful. And if you look back and you look at the most successful companies, it's usually one or two key people who pick up the company, put them on, on their back, and they carry them. And every successful CEO in Ontario that I've worked with was like almost a maniacally possessed individual. And he sought, or she sought, to get more of those people because you get a critical mass of that attitude and amazing things happen with your company. Now, I'm not trying to say, don't look at resumes, but I am saying, take some time to get to know people. Can you help me? Thank you. So, <clears throat> know thyself. It's the best slide we could get. It's a little strange, <laughs> but know thyself is one of the flaws that I find when people go out to hire. Typically, the individual says, I've got to hire something, something. Uh, I've got to build a job description. I've got to write down all these requirements. And they haven't really thought about, A, go back to the Empathica story, what are the needs of the team? And more importantly, what are the needs of the leader? Because if you think about it, the best way to hire is not to fill the job, but to complement the entity called team. In some contexts, for me, for example, I am highly, highly introverted. The ideal complement to me is obviously an extrovert, but rarely do you see the word extrovert in a job description. Why isn't it there? Well, I think we learned how to write, to write job descriptions from the people in large corporations, where, as Christina pointed out earlier, you can tolerate a different skill set. You can you've got systems, you've got processes that will carry a mediocre performer. But if you guys want to build something special, then it's important that you, you complement your existing leadership team. So if you think about the rise of research in motion, you've got two CEOs, co-CEOs. I thought that was brilliant, right? You've got Balzilli handling the sales, marketing, and hockey team, and then you've got Lazaridis making sure that the code works and that product gets shipped and that it relatively reflects the market realities. That's brilliance. And if you take a moment to understand what your strengths are, I urge you to incorporate that into and I don't want to use the word job description, but for this purpose, I'll say, weave it into the job description so you understand who you are. I mean, I don't know about you, but not everybody is 100% the perfect leader. Ask yourself, am I a leader? 
Do I need a leader? Do I need a socializer to round up my team to make the, the company more fun? Do I need uh, somebody to organize Friday night parties? Because I don't want to do that. Um, do I need an organizer who's going to make things happen? So the idea is to pull away from the job description and say, what's the outcome we want from this, from this head count that we're going to add? So we're back at Empathica. And if you look at how we've done things, I mentioned earlier, we did this. In other words, experience is nice. Got to have some experience. It reduces your risk when you hire. But we didn't want rock star experience. We didn't need it. Knowledge, well, we can acquire knowledge over time. Understanding, well, I see those two as somewhat related. Curiosity, huge, enormous. Because remember that one of the things we, that Empathica wanted to do was get themselves people who are going to solve problems in innovative ways. Sometimes those problems have never been solved before. So we would historically go out and try to hire, for some clients, a software engineer who knew syntax. And syntax is crucial, right? But you can also look up syntax. But you look for people who have that persistence. They're going to bang their head against the wall until they figure out how to solve things. And that begins with curiosity. Because some people don't show up with curiosity. They show up with memory. And the people who've memorized things don't belong in a small companies. Because you're not trying to replicate the past. You want to invent a future. Let's go to capacity and fit. Now, if you think about it, fit goes back to does this individual play well with our team? Because one of the things that I've seen, I'm sure you've seen, is that oftentimes we set out to fill a job and we actually create a vacancy elsewhere. And the reason we create a, a vacancy, well, we, actually we do create a vacancy elsewhere, but within our own team, you've upset the apple cart and now you're losing somebody. His arrival or her arrival has actually been uh, a reason for someone else to leave. Why? Because the chemistry doesn't work. And oftentimes, going back to the job description, people overlook that need for chemistry. My favorite two are integrity and motivation. And both of those, I wish I could take credit for them, originated from D. Hawk's pitch on how to do your hiring. Nothing is more important than those two. And so when I look at integrity, I go, all right, you know what? It's important. It's obvious. Everybody knows you want to hire somebody with integrity. But the truth of the matter is we often hire people who don't have integrity. And the, and the one cue I'm going to give you right now is that when you see job records that show short stays, it's usually attributed to one of two things. Either the individual is less than competent or the individual's integrity or personality was in question. So to me, when I want to manage risk for my clients, the first thing I look at is, okay, is the integrity there? Is it reflected in the job description? Sorry, in, in the resume. And at the same time, we use various questions in the interview process to elicit, is this guy going to be a straight shooter? Is he going to come in saying, I want $110,000 and now we want him. Oh, I don't want one hundred and ten. I want one hundred and sixty dollars now. And that kind of integrity blossoms. I, I always say that you, you learn more about a candidate when you make them the offer and negotiate the offer than you did through the entire interviewing process. So seek out the, the integrity, seek out the motivation. And the single fastest way to understand an individual's motivation, I use this all the time. I'll sit down and I'll say, so what do you want to know? And that's my first question. I'm going to let them interview me. And I'm going to listen to those questions because those questions will steer me to where and what they're interested in. If the individual says, well, I thought you were going to interview me. Well, guess what? I've learned a ton about that individual. He starts asking me, oh, you were supposed to turn that off. <laughs> Come on. It's okay, you're forgiven. But if, if you think about the, the whole essence of motivation, and if you throw it back to the individual and let them tell you what they're about, I think one of the flaws with interviews is the interviewer usually tries to lead. Well, if you do a quick search on Amazon for, you know, it, we'll call it to managing your career or job interviews or landing that job, there's like 70,000 books on the subject there's probably less than 5% for the employer to protect him or herself from those candidates. And so to me, if you remember anything from this, integrity and motivation, and let the individual tell you what their motivations are. It'll come through in the interview process, because especially if you ask them, so what do you want to do? And if they don't know, I think you've learned a whole lot. I think it's yours. Yeah, and that leads into uh, to the, the next point around 
passion. And uh, we talked about integrity and motivation. And a lot of what motivates is a person's passion about your business or about their career. And, you know, I'm always amazed at how infrequently that is the, the nut of the interview process. But, you know, sometimes you, you hire someone and you find out after the fact that they took the job because, you know, they feel something about your company or they have a personal connection to what you're doing. So what we aim to do early in the process is really understand what makes a person tick and what drives them to, to their profession. So understand, you know, why did you choose to go in this way? Did this profession choose you or did you choose it? Because a lot of people fell into the thing that they're doing and what they really want to do is out there five years down the road and, and you can let someone else take them on that five-year journey. Um, or it's something about your company that is really inspiring to them. So to go back to really understand your team and understand yourself, I think companies need to spend some time understanding who are the people who are really passionate about them. So as a leader, you know why you started this company and you know what the mission of your business is and, and why, um, why you show up every day. But the people who follow you are following you for a reason. And uh, it's not their paycheck. Um, if, if the motivation behind I need the job is I need a job, um, you satisfy that the day that you hire them and then now they don't need a job anymore. So why do they, you know, why do they show up apart from the fact that I, tomorrow I still need a job? Um, so understand the people that follow you, why do they follow you and why might they follow, why might they follow your, your um, your inspiration, your company mission? Is it something about your business? And your, the nice thing about startups is it's, it, you usually understand that very well and everyone in the, in the company can see their contribution towards that. So you really have the advantage there. It's also to do with the profession. So in some cases we work with companies and, and what they're doing is, um, is maybe a little less than inspiring because they're building um, internet an internet ad platform or something that, you know, it's it maybe a little tricky to rally yourself around that. But someone technical might see, you know, this huge, amazing technical problem that they get to solve and they get to deal with all this data and it's just, you know, it's amazing. And they're going to get up, you know, early in the morning and stay up late at night thinking about these problems and solving them on your behalf. So, so really do understand what it is that drives people and how do you figure that out before you hire them. Um, so there's, there's an interesting story, uh, there's a company in Waterloo, which is where I work most days, um, that makes applications for, mobile applications for individuals that have um, autism or um, mental or behavioral issues. So great company mission, you know that the founders have a personal connection to this, they started the company because they're personally affected, um, you know, by some of these challenges. and when they go out to hire, um, sort of traditional hiring methodology would say you need a really good project manager, go out and find a really good project manager but, or a really good sort of lead of customer service. And then the lead of customer service um, hire is the one that sticks out in my mind because they were looking for a specific series of skills, but most of those things were things that people can learn. You know, a lot of that had to do with personality. So they interviewed some people and they found someone who was personally affected by, um, by these conditions. So, you know, they had someone in their family that was autistic. So they understood how this was going to solve important problems that made a difference to them. And now they have someone who probably on paper was not the best, it didn't have the best resume, didn't have the best background for the lead of customer service in a startup, maybe not the right technical background, but you better believe they're staying up late at night, they're learning all the technology um, that they need to know to do the job the best that they can because they have to show up and they're really inspired to deliver the best service and to help this company succeed because they're personally affected, as personally affected as the founders of the company. So really look for passion and, and sometimes it's, it's not necessarily there before you meet the person. So they don't necessarily show up knowing that their, their goal in life is uh, to, to solve the problem that your business solves. But you have to be able to light that spark. 
So part of the interview process has to be talking about what it is that, that your business does and why, why you're there. And you know, what is the story behind, behind this company? What difference is it going to make? And in a lot of cases, that's, um, it's a lot easier for a startup to explain that because it tends to be simple and finite and you've probably pitched it to investors and, and you know what that is um, more than a big company because you're not going to be a cog in a wheel as this, this person, this is the impact that you're going to have and you have to look for that spark. And you have to be sure that you, that you hire someone that understands that, um, understands where they're going and the impact that they're going to make and that it means something to them because really needing a job is, um, is not a good reason to hire somebody. Um, it's, it's certainly motivation. So, you know, someone might say the most motivated employee is the person who needs the job, the, ba the you know, the, the baddest, but that's not um, something that's sustainable, obviously. So, The next thing that I wanted to talk about is just some of the, some of the mistakes that we see, um, some of the challenges, because obviously a lot of companies are hiring people that end up in that 77%. Um, so what happens in that interview process that you select somebody um, that isn't after a period of time engaged anymore? And the interesting thing is that most employees in the first two, three months, um, they get through the probation. They show up. They're enthusiastic. They're excited. They, you know, they are putting everything into their job. And then some something happens, and it slips. And I think you know, one of the things that we see, and we saw it even just earlier this week, is that the intent to hire is often an intent to solve a burning problem in a company or to take advantage of a of an opportunity that is relatively short short sighted and short term. So. One of the examples, and the reason why this Rolodex is here, and the interesting thing that some, someone junior in our company didn't know what a Rolodex was, but, uh, but that is what it is. Um, so, so we hear, you know, we, you know, hire me a VP of sales. I want a guy with a great Rolodex um, because, or I want someone who can help us close the deal with Royal Bank or that can solve this particular problem. And the challenge with hiring someone who just has a great Rolodex, as an example, is if the people in that Rolodex aren't your business, or what happens six months later when they're out of personal contacts? You know, I, everyone that I play racquetball with, I've pitched, and none of them are, are, are buying now what? So you have someone who may perform very well in a short term, who may know all the right people, but doesn't necessarily have the passion and the motivation and everything else to sustain you. And it really does, it can eclipse the process. So the challenge with looking for the human is oftentimes when you see the great resume, it's very, very uh, alluring. So, you know, here's someone who's worked for the competition or here's somebody who, you know, has a family member in our biggest prospect. You know, we can close this business because their brother-in-law is, you know, is somebody special. So. You know, we see companies doing that all the time when really you have to be focused on the long term. So you have to be assuming that your business is going to be around in 18 months and two years and that those people still have to come up, you know, come into work every day and give 120 percent. And in some cases that means sacrificing the short term gain to get someone who's going to going to produce in the long term and startups especially. It's fast. So you need somebody who's going to you know, again, resi be resilient and who's going to be curious and who's going to love change and who's going to be okay if the skill set that you hire them for today isn't the one you need in three months or six months. Because if you, and I think of another example of someone who wanted, um, you know, an Oracle expert because today their Oracle system was, you know, a mess and they needed that fixed. But in six months they planned to change from Oracle to something else. So they needed someone who's okay, who's that expert, but who is okay not doing that again in six months and moving into something else. And that's a really tough, you know, that's a really tall order because really what you need is someone who loves your business, who understands, you know, what you need to do technically. And in some cases that might mean hiring someone temporarily to solve the problem that you have today because they're the best person for the problem, but not necessarily 
the most suitable person for your company for the long term. And that's a really hard thing for um, for startups and, and young companies to get that to get over is that in some cases maybe it's a temporary employee, maybe it's a temporary fix um, for a particular problem. So you know the the point here is really look at, you know, understand the types of humans that are going to be the right people for your company down the road and be patient. You know, understand that things like knowledge and, um, and experience are things that they can potentially get while they're with your company, but hiring the right people um, that have the capacity. So things like smarts and, and motivation and integrity are, are far more important than experience over the short term. Um, and I think we have, back. A, we have, uh, okay. I love this saying. It is unbelievably true to everything we do in life. It, our politicians, our spouses, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, they're all a reflection of how we see the world. Um, how do we see the world? I touched earlier on the fact that resumes are a really wonderful fortress to conceal things. Although we've learned that, or we learn to believe that it's really good to look at them, I want to take you somewhere else. I want to take you to who's that human. And these are lessons that I learned over time. So I, I, there was a time when I figured, oh, look, this guy's been in sports. He must be a competitor. Makes sense. And especially if you want to build a small company, you're going to need competitors because you've got competition trying to eat your breakfast. So you better have a competitive mindset. Well, the reality was I found that a lot of folks do sports. A lot of people do sports for social reasons, and a lot of people do sports to compete. And then there's my all-time favorite, the competitor who's an individual. If I can give you one piece of advice, if ever you're, you're narrowing it down, you've got a couple of candidates to look at, if you see an individual who's competed individually, grab that individual. Because he or she will bring you a mindset that you won't get from the other athletes. And the same thing happens in other realms, right? You look at people who say, well, I can sell. Well, that's good. You can sell. What have you sold? And if, you're, if your solution is new or if your, your product or your brand isn't known, you need a substantially better individual to sell for you than the individual who sold for Microsoft or for IBM. I used to laugh when I first got in the business. I used to be enamored with IBM people. Anybody from IBM here? Okay, thank God. See, I used to be enamored with those guys. They'd come in and they'd go, yeah, I sold two million last year. And then what you realize is they, 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 they answered the phone the required number of times to do $2 million in revenue. Conversely, you find an individual who works for a startup. Nobody's ever heard him. He, doesn't get it. he never gets invited to RFPs. He never gets invited to meetings. He's a nobody. And then you find out that he sold the first two or three to early adopters of whatever he sells. That guy, when you see that, grab it because that's special. As long as that individual's still hungry, as long as he didn't make a bazillion dollars on that, on that first big deal, and he's still got the hunger, then he knows what it is to struggle. And believe me, young companies struggle. It's the nature of the beast. And so to go a little further, I look at resumes all the time, and people say, well, again, big brand versus little brand. Well, I want the guy with the big brand because he knows process. Well, I don't know if you guys have to worry about process in the early days. I somehow doubt it, quite frankly. And the process actually hides incompetence, as Christina mentioned earlier. So when you've got two candidates and you're not sure which one you want to go with, take a chance on the guy who doesn't have that brand, but shows you those things we talked about earlier, the integrity, the motivation, and some form of accomplishment. How are we doing for time? You want to kick us out yet, or we can keep going? You guys are doing great. Okay, you want to play a game? Sure. Okay. Do you want to kick it off, or shall I? Okay, so you guys are probably falling asleep, right? Because we're really boring, I know. <laughs> you could have said no. I saw one no. <laughs> Ladies, gentlemen, please work with us. So I'm going to give you a, a scenario, and I want, to, I want to hear your feedback. Okay, so you're going to hire, let's see, you're going to hire a software engineer. Anybody here hire software engineers? Okay, so we've got a few. And if you don't, just work with it, okay? You've got two candidates. On paper, they look identical. You meet them both, and they're essentially identical. Your collaborators all figure they are identical. One has a Gmail e email account, and one has Hotmail. He's a software engineer. Who do you hire? Gmail? 
Gmail? Anybody Hotmail? Who likes Hotmail? Oh man, you guys are good. <laughs> that one went nowhere. <laughs> Correct. Uh, and do you know why you did it? Why would you choose Gmail? Uh, well, Google's more innovative, I'd say, these days. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Hot, Hotmail seems passe, really. It does, doesn't it? And, and, when you, and, and there's nothing wrong with Hotmail. But that persona, the individual who still retains his Hotmail account 10, 15 years later, Nothing wrong with him, highly competent, but he's probably not the guy for the startup. Because you want the individual who's chasing the future, who's looking at cool ways to do new things, and not to say that you know, your email strategy is going to tell you everything, but it's an indicator that you, when you peel back that resume, you go, why did he choose, or why didn't he evolve in email? What's yours? You um, hiring a sales exec, and or marketing exec, and you see somebody from, um, again, two resumes, you're deciding who do you want to meet first, and you see someone who has worked in the Toronto office of Facebook, and someone who has worked for Eloqua. I don't know if anyone knows Eloqua. Startup. Highly successful highly Canadian Highly successful company. Canadian startup. Um, Facebook Eloqua. Anyone have a, uh, a marketing person that they want to? Wow. This is a bit of a trickier one. You're a startup. Why? Uh, working at a startup, I think, is much different than working at a subsidiary of what is now a major company. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we look at as well is that the, um, there's a lot of really great innovative technology companies that have a Canadian office. And, you know, but most of the innovation happened quite a long time ago in another office somewhere else. So the, um, the other thing that you have to look at is what did they do before, before you know, the, the Facebook store? And, and then why did, they do, why did they make that decision? Why would you go to a, a more mature organization that, um, you know, that has the Canadian offices? Because you're, you're looking for pedigree, and that's one of the things that you know, we often hear from our customers is we want to hire pedigree. You know, find us somebody who's got you know, Microsoft or Facebook or Google on their resume, and, and we want to see those people. But sometimes that pedigree is a little bit misleading because um, it's safe and the job is very narrow and it's not necessarily experience that is going to translate into into your small business so they don't necessarily need to be that, that resilient um, person who needs to figure out what to do and the same thing goes for sales which is why I started there but on the sales side you know as Mario had alluded to if you pick up the phone and say, I'm calling from Microsoft, the person's going to answer the phone, probably. Um, if you call and say, I'm calling from a company you've never even heard of, um, you're going to have a much harder time. So the person who's successful, even if the success isn't as quantifiably large in, a, in that small company that no one's ever heard of, their experience translates better into the type of work that you probably need them to do. And I'll add one more dimension to hiring the Facebook guy or the, the big brand guy. They cost a fortune. They are like 25 to 50 percent more expensive. So for a startup, go digging in the in the what I call the, the long tail. There's a whole lot of market out there of smaller companies, and you want that talent because it's more cost effective. It'll work harder, and it's not as big of a shift when they join your startup. I got one more. Okay, so we have time. So you run a sales organization. And again, you've, got, you've, you've whittled it down. You've got two candidates. One candidate grew up in downtown Toronto. And this is going to work. Work with me here, okay? The other one grew up in downtown Sudbury. I did that for you. Who do you hire? The downtown Toronto person or the Sudburyan? Sudburyan. Who do you hire? They look identical on paper. They both have good quotas. They've, they've validated. They, they showed up with their T4s. The T4s are essentially identical. Everything's essentially the same. We have a winner. I know it. You can do it. Sudbury, for sure. Because oh, you're from Sudbury. No. You know why I say that? Because the person in Toronto has an extensive support network already in Toronto. When they, they don't have to move here. They don't have to develop it. You betcha. Someone from Sudbury had to come here and had to, to establish themselves and succeed hundred percent right you you get people who make a migration in their lives and that alone tells you that they were able to reinvent and so a few years back that's how Christina and I met 
she's from Sudbury if you hadn't figured it out. But the truth is, she was a batch of, she was one of four or five Sudburyans, and it was shocking to see how effective these people were. Now, I, I'm going to add a dimension onto yours, and it's when you come from a small town, you are far more effective socially. And I remember one of the guys telling me, well, the reason is when you walk the streets of Sudbury, you're going to see that guy repeatedly, whereas we live in relative anonymity in Toronto. And that doesn't give you the same interpersonal and negotiating and social skills that you're going to get from somebody from a small town. That's why Christina's so amazing. It makes a difference where they come from. And so again, we're peeling back. Nobody tells you where they were born. Nobody tells you when they migrated to Canada. I'll hire any time when the individual, when the individual gives me a story, hopefully it's true, where he or she migrated and, and had to evolve or transition because those are the challenges inherent to running a small software company. Do you have anything else? Um, well, I think one of the things that, and I know that the, the, the conversation today really focused on the selection piece of recruitment and and there's a lot of other moving parts to get recruiting right and a lot of that has to do with marketing your job and attracting the right people and you know getting people to accept that offer when you give it to them um, so the neat thing about focusing on the human and, and, and those qualities and focusing on the passion is that it really bleeds into all of those other areas and makes you successful in all the other pieces of recruitment so at the very front end if you look at job descriptions now, um, it looks like a purchasing order for the most part. So if you go on to um, you know, the, the job posting board of the day and you look at you know, someone that's looking to hire everything from an executive down to a tactical individual, you'll see this shopping list of, of experience and skills that they need to bring to the job. And there's probably something about why our company's great. And then there's like a whole big section at the bottom about how cool our fridge and our ping pong table is. And, uh, and that's why you should come and work here, because we're, you know, we're fun. Um, but it doesn't speak at all to what's going to get that person, like, f totally fired up about the mission. So it doesn't say, you know, if you do this job and you do it really, really well, this is the impact that you're going to have on the market, on the customer, on, on your colleagues, on the team that you're going to hire. So... If you're really passionate about fixing stuff, we've got some broken stuff that you need to come and fix. If you're really passionate about, um, you know, healthcare, then, you know, we're going to help. We're really solving these problems and you can be a big part of that. And you will get better and more of the right people showing up at the table. And maybe your shopping list isn't as long because you don't want to scare away some of those people that don't necessarily have that minimum, that you know, ideal amount of experience, or they haven't come from exactly the right company, or they might not have all of the right technical um, acronyms on their resume. But that's okay because you drop the bar a little bit on the knowledge and experience piece, and you're really looking for passion. So you'll get more inspired people, and um, you know, you'll be looking for those things first. So that really does help on the on the marketing front end, and then through the interview process. If you sit down with somebody and you, you know, pitch your company and explain, you know, the job and who you're looking for, and then you ask them to walk through their resume, and, and this is sort of the typical interview process, walk me through your resume, tell me what you did here, and how, where did you use SQL, and where did you do this, and, um, and thank you very much, and have a nice day, that person leaves feeling like, did I sell it? You know, I've got this bag of skills, and, and do you want to buy it? And if you're not looking to hire that person who just maybe wants the job most, you're going to miss the people who, who want to feel like they're part of a team. So if instead your interview process asks questions like, so where did you grow up and, and why did you come here and why did you choose this profession? And, you know, what is it that you want to know about us? And, and what's the best team that you can imagine? And what do you like to have in a boss? And, you know, what is what's the most inspirational leader that you've ever worked for and, and tell me about them. Um, that person leaves feeling like if I'm chosen to be part of this team, it's because this team is where I belong and I'm going to be happy here. So your ability to close those people because their experience through that interview process is going to be so different from all the other places that they're talking to um, or, or better than the job that they have because you're, you know, your best people probably have a job that they go to every day and, uh, and you're, you know, the absolute best people are probably fully engaged in that job. So to get them to move to you, they really do have to feel a personal connection to you as the leader and to the team. 
And if you don't have that dialogue to get to know the human, they haven't gotten to know you either. So, you know, put yourself out there and explain your story. Um, so that'll help you to close people as well. So the message isn't just about, the, about selection, but it's about the whole recruiting process because I think it, it, it bleeds into, into all areas. And then it'll, it'll, you know, turn into what is your culture. Well, it's a culture of all these great people who are fully motivated and that will, it'll, it'll define itself because of the team. And I think that's it. So I, we, I think we've got some time. I don't know unless you had something else to add. No, I think we're good. We're good. I think if we have you time guys to. Have questions. I'd love to hear. I bet you Christina has an answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've got quite a lot of time left. So. Oh. You had a question, Marielle. I had a question. It, some of it has been answered, but you know, you're talking about looking for that spark when you meet the person. Mm -hmm. So when you have a stack of a hundred resumes, and. You know, as you mentioned, they, they may not look great on paper. Um, they may not have exactly what you're looking for. How do you identify that person? You can't meet with everyone. You have to choose who you're going to meet with. What if you're missing out on someone? Is there something else that you can add to that initial application and resume process that you might be able to help you identify these potential? Um, for sure. So I think that, and I don't know if you want to talk to this, but I think that as you're, um, as you're you know, looking for applicants, people send in, um, I don't know if cover letters are still, like we occasionally get them, usually we've had a conversation first, but I think people sort of approach you blindly and send, ask specific questions at the front end that, um, you know, to tell like, the person to, that elicit and some sort of insightful response. So A, it'll get that list of 100 resumes down because I don't know what they teach people when they leave university or, or school about how to apply for jobs, but I've heard numbers like you have to apply for 400 jobs. And I don't know how you do that because it hurts my head to even think about how do you find 100 jobs to apply for. But it looks like click, 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 click. And technology, you know, thanks to LinkedIn and everything else, applying for a job is so easy that you just click and, it's, and off it goes. But you don't really, so in that stack of 100, you're right, there's probably 10 or 15% who applied because they love what you're doing and they think that wow like you know to be part of this team is my dream and and then everybody else just clicked and you've without having some way of really getting to know the person at the front end um, it's a tricky thing to do so there's things that you can look for um, in the resume which again then you start getting a little bit random if you're looking for um, you know, what school did they go to? And, and those things aren't necessarily titles. There's all kinds of things that people use to get a big stack of resumes down to small keyword searches. Um, don't get me started. Um, but it's going to be false. So I think finding a way, and that's, you know, it's probably the best way to do it, is to find a way at that intake process so people apply for a job. And, uh, and I don't know a whole lot of startups that have a volume problem, that have the problem of 100 resumes. But in some cases, if it's co-op students and that sort of thing, that, that, that is the case. Um, but to put some gates up, you know, so, so ask some questions at the front end that, that really elicit, you know, tell me about, um, you know, why you chose your profession or did the profession cho choose you or you've got some good well, questions at the front end. About a year and a half ago, I tried to hire an intern. And it was a heck of an experience. Because here I've gone from hiring execs where it's really simple. You can just read some stuff and you get a pretty good sense and you can call some people and you know who you have. But when you try to hire new grads, it is astounding. It was scary. It was depressing. <laughs> Cover letters are essentially 95% the same document. You know, substitute name here, change the date, and shazam, they're pumping it out. Resumes look essentially the same. And one of the tricks we used was we'd put a little thing in the ad saying something like, tell us who your favorite stooge is. And the intent there was simply to see, did somebody read the posting or are they just cranking? And the truth of the matter is they were cranking. They were cranking. And so on the heels of that experience, and I don't want to turn this into a commercial for us, but we're launching a piece of software, hopefully later this year, that addresses some of that issue. And what we found is you could give people a series of questions. Let them pick whatever question they want to answer, but you'd be amazed at what happened for us because all of a sudden, like my favorite question, the very first question we ever threw out to the university kids was, how many friends do you have on Facebook and why should we care? Unbelievable, the answers we got. But what was insightful for us is you could see cognition happening for some. 
you could see a total lack of cognition for others. And to your question, you could start parting. And if you layered on another question that they could answer online, well, all of a sudden you're starting to stream all sorts of real sharp Cracker Jacks. And then the great unwashed, that 90% that will never make it with a small software company because because they're cranking out, you know, they're, they're doing it. How many resumes can I crank out every minute? And that's not the guy or the girl that you want to have on your team. Are there any other questions? Um, so I'm, I'm doing a, a recruiting process right now, so this is really fresh. And I think what happens is when you're strapped for time and you're growing rapidly, you, you're trying to reduce risk when you're, when you're hiring. So on the job description you put, it's like a wish list of I want this, this, and this, and you think, I'm going to reduce my risk if I pick the candidate that most clearly matches the job description. So mm -hmm. I just had recently an interview, a second interview, with somebody who nails it. They have everything we need, um, but the two flag, the flag for us is they hadn't looked at our website or knew any of our programs or watched any of our videos or done any research, even in the second interview, and not a lot of questions. So you're like, okay, here's this perfect candidate. But this is such a huge, so when you're talking about passion, my thing is why am I wanting the, I w I'm trying to reduce my risk because I don't have time to train somebody um, up and spend all this time onboarding and then, um, you know, I want them to kind of like plug and play, um, which is bad, yeah, and, and it, so this is really good for me. But then th how do I measure the passion? How do I say, okay, this candidate, kind of like Marielle, how do you read through and find, Okay, so they don't match everything, but this is one of these people that punches above what they've done. They're going to bring... See, I, I, in my opinion, the first flaw, when you go to your job description and you allow that thing to get, give dominion over the decision process, what you're going to end up with is a person who can do that job. But we are now in, a, in a, an evolutionary cycle where we're learning stuff constantly. And the decision you made to hire that individual because he or she could do the job today, well, you managed your risk, but you actually just delayed it because it's going to catch up to you. Because that individual, if they are star, if they're star material, they want to be hired for their potential. They want to be hired for what they haven't done. And the truth is, I mean, I find it remarkable. You'll get some people who, who come to us and they, you know, they want massive raises. And well, I always say, great, you'll, but understand that we might get you that massive raise, but you're going to end up doing what you've done in the past. You're like the person who's not going to evolve because there's a trade-off. Every job is actually a, a combination. I get paid some money and I get some really cool excitement, experience, and you put the two together. But if you're going to insist on massive amounts of money, well, we're going to ask you to replicate your past over and over and over again because you're really good at that. But you probably don't want to hire that person. You want to hire the individual who, you actually want to hire somebody who's below what you need. I know you want to go fast, right? But I, I, if you get the right sense of values out of that person when you ask them. So tell me, tell me about growing up. Let's get off the resume. Get off the resume, push, push it aside and say, tell me about growing up. Tell me about uh, the things that you read about. Another question I like to ask is tell me about your bookmarks. Because those bookmarks will be tremendously telling. If you're, you're talking to somebody who's involved in, well, well I'll give you an example. Um, we're, not, we're trying to hire a writer right now. And to me, if they aren't on Twitter, they aren't a writer. So the doc tells me, it speaks to me. How would you do it? Um, you know, I think that the same, um, the idea of looking at, looking for the skills in the resume, I think you have to, if you need someone who's going to give 100%, they have to have been giving 100% in the interview process. Because you have to assume that someone, you know, when they're auditioning, they're putting their best, their best work forward. And if you just don't see that at the front end, I think that's a showstopper. Because, again, you're going to find someone, that, to go back to the research that, uh, that we did with Charles, you're going to get someone who has all of the tools and they're going to come and they're going to you know, put in f whatever the minimum amount of effort is to execute on that job and to, to use, their, use that tool set. If you find someone who's learning but is excited about the mission, their 100% with less experience l delivers more results. And, and looks a whole lot better than someone's 50% that's done it before because it's by rote and they're not really thinking about it. The other thing that you can look for, and sometimes this is in a resume, and I know that, you know, I have people that I'm writing a resume and, and you know that little part at the end that says what my interests are, is, is that important? I'm like, absolutely. Like, who reads a resume and doesn't flip right away after you, like, learn a little bit to, like, 
what does this person do? And they, they like professionally fly kites or they, you know, do something crazy. And, you know, we've, we've seen questions like, what, what do you do that, you know, outside of work that, um, you know, that, that no sane person would do? What's the biggest risk that you've ever taken? And then you find that, you know, somebody, you know, climbs mountains or they, they you know, volunteer their time or they, they do something that's incredible. And if that relates to your business, then that's really what you're looking for. So if you need someone to mentor and they don't mentor in their, in their spare time, then you kind of wonder, like, do you really want to mentor people? Do you really want to lead people? But, you know, you want to lead people. And I see here that you, you know, volunteer with student groups and you, you know, you, you've done this kind of mentoring type of role voluntarily over time. So look at people, what people do in the time that is their own time. And if that mimics what you need them to do in their paid time, they will you know, they'll show up because you think, you know, every hour after 40 hours is volunteer time and they better be doing it because they love to do it. Otherwise, they're going to check out um, and they may, you know, they may not even give you that full, that full work week. The other thing that happens when you somewhat under hire, but you get the passion and the intensity and the desire and the drive and the, all, that stuff, <clears throat> all that stuff, your job is now leadership as opposed to supervision. And so it becomes so much more gratifying to hire that individual who just wants to get in the game and will, will take that time on their own after those 40 hours to do stuff. So if you go back to the original slide where we talked about you know, people who are engaged at work, well, when you've got an engaged team, you're a leader. When you don't have an engaged team, you're a supervisor. That sucks because you can't run a company that way. You can't grow it because you're busy looking after your entity as opposed to looking at the marketplace. So aspire to get those people that allow you to lead. You'll know. You'll, when you meet them, you know. Yeah. And they'll make decisions based on the, the ways that you would make decisions as well. So that they know where you're going, you, you know, you have to provide them with less, less direction. Direction and inspiration, and this is where we want to go. And, and, you know, if those are the types of people that if you give them a little bit of rope, they're going to take risks and be innovative and be creative and, and show initiative and do all of those things. Um, as opposed to what's the minimum that I need to get done today. Oh, okay, um, very good presentation, very insightful. Um, question for you, so I hire somebody, they check out really well, good references, amazing resume, they go through the interviewing process, they're passionate, and then six, eight months, 12 months go by, and then all of a sudden they kind of do this, and they just drop off, so they, they move from that, you know, that performance category into that disengage category. What am I doing wrong or what can I do better up front to ensure they're, they're in it for the long term? Because as a startup, that's what I want, right? I don't want somebody that's one, two years gone. You want the, the perfect situation. <laughs> no, don't we all? It usually starts out that way, yes. You know what? At the eight month mark, if you, if you see somebody going sideways on you, that's a conversation. Yeah. And because, I mean, in my opinion, if you've got a non-performer and you're, I shouldn't be saying this, but if, you've got a, if you're a small company and you've got a non-performer, it's a conversation. And it's gotta be a conversation that has a conclusion. And that conclusion could say, look, if you're not happy, I understand, just tie me over till we get to the next step. That's not what they tell you in the big, you know, in, in the HR manager's book. But realistically, you don't wanna play that game. You have to make tough decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, can you turn him or her around? I don't know, that, that's your call. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's conversations and it's blunt. It's right, we're in this together because you are, right? You're in this little canoe and there's water coming in. And you go, okay, so do we throw you overboard or do we throw me over? I'm staying. Are you in? Yeah, because you have to find out what happened. And in a lot of cases, it's just the business changed. And I was having fun when there were 10 people and now we're 40 people and I'm not having as much fun anymore. Well, why? Is it because you need to be in a 10-person company, in which case that's not us anymore? And like, good, good luck. So should I be spending more time up front looking for that real adaptive individual that yeah. can function really well when it's 10 people and 50 people, they're still engaged and, and leading, right? They can be How early right is this employee? Person. Sorry? How early of a hire was this employee? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. We were a 10-person shop now. We're, yeah. So the world changed. Yeah, absolutely. And that's where you get, you even see that in leadership, right? You'll get people who are amazing when the company goes from, from zero million to 10 million, and then it, somehow it gets a little tougher, and it gets a little tougher to the point where even the leadership is flawed, and they actually belong, they, they, and that's an honest conversation that says, look, you know, this may not be the right place for us. 
maybe you should be moving on. And it doesn't have to be a, an adversarial situation. It can just be a conversation. It's a, yeah, the evolution. Of the yeah. 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 Because, uh, you know, to get back to the, the point around sort of long-term hiring versus short-term hiring, sometimes you do need to get through something. And you hire someone who's, a, who's an expert at getting through something. And, you know, you don't want to compromise the integrity and, and passion and all of those things. But once you're through it, you have to look at that person and say, okay, are you ready to evolve into the next person that we need? Because if we're hiring for the, your job today, we need someone that can do all of these things. And, and that's different than what we needed you to do the last six months. So are you in? And if they're not in, then you know, you, that's a tough conversation to have potentially. Yeah. But, um, but it can also be a managed exit. I mean, yeah, it can, can, in yeah. an ideal scenario, you manage, especially when you've got a small team. You want to say, look, we're in this together. Like, carry me over. I'll help you. And it's mutual. Yeah. And then it's, you know, it could, because if you, small companies often have cycles. So, you know, in R&D, you're innovating, innovating. Ideally, you're continuing to innovate, innovate. But sometimes you just need to build this one thing and then you need to do something else with it. And, uh, and when you hire the innovator builder and now you're maintaining, like, you've got a disengaged employee. Because if they're not, if they're a builder and you're not asking them to build stuff, they've probably got a resume ready. That's, you know, and they're looking for someone who's building the next thing. And... Like that has to be okay, yeah. because the reality is your 10 people, your 15 people that are your first hires are probably not all the same humans to get you through to the, same, to the next um, phase of the company. And maybe they are, but, um, but I think in a lot of cases, you know, if what you do is raise money and then all of a sudden you don't need to raise money anymore, then um, the question is, did you need to hire that person as an employee at the first, you know, or, or was it something that's like, hey, we have got this one year's worth of work? Um, sometimes you don't know that up front. Thank you. Did you have a... Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, besides LinkedIn, where else would you find a, a pool of talent to kind of actually go out and initiate the conversation with them to, to attract them? Um, and this is back to the recruiting thing. I, I mean, the, the answer is it depends. So really what you have to look at is, you know, who are you hiring for and where are they? So, you know, the, the question is really, you know, if we have people saying, like, I need to hire engineers, and I need to hire engineers that have, you know, that are interested in this kind of activity, well, where are they? Are they, you know, are they on the open source sites? And maybe which case, let's go and look, and look for people who are doing some open source stuff. Um, what companies are they working in? You know, would be our approach, because they're probably working somewhere, and we can just go, go catch them where they are today. Um, but it really depends it depends on sort of who you're looking for. So yes, LinkedIn is sort of the catch-all. So, you know, if you're in tech and you have a career and you, you aren't there, we wonder what's wrong with you. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe you're just highly engaged in your day job and you just haven't bothered. But um, there isn't another sort of social online place that is where that is the place where everybody hangs out. But you have to think about those people and where the community, you know, there's an example of, uh, and it's not a startup example, but um, it's a Cisco example, but Cisco realized that most of the people that sold for their organization um, were in a certain um, kind of social class and they did, they did certain things and they realized that there was lots of wine connoisseurs in their social, in their, in their sales organization. So they started advertising for sales reps at wine shows and they found that there's lots of people selling Cisco that are going to wine tastings and wine shows. And that's, I mean, that's a big, that's big data, right? So that's not something that you can necessarily learn from because, um, you know, the big companies of the world, you know, Starbucks knows where to go for people because they hire so many people that they just look at their data and they say, oh, look at every Starbucks employee also, you know, does something socially. So let's just go there and get them. As a startup, you have to sit back and really think about it. Um, you know, if you're looking for people who are very rah-rah startup community, tech community, then where are those people congregating? You know, are they all, you know, are they going to TED? You know, are they doing, you know, Ignite? Are they involved in certain things? And let's tap into that pool. And then it's networks. So you find people who are like those people and you look at them and you say, you know, where else have they worked? and what do they do socially and, and can we tap into their, their network? Because the, the other neat thing that happens when you hire really engaged employers, employees is that they are your promoters. So all of a sudden, 
your 10 people and now you have like a recruiting force of 10 because you know if you have half that team is telling people don't come work here then you're they're working clearly working against you um, but if everyone on your team thinks you're a great place to work make sure that you empower them give them the message you know feed them you know here put this on your twitter you know put this on your linkedin put this on your facebook because we need to hire more people like you and get them out there spreading the word and the neat idea i had heard someone you know, send your people out to um, events where people like them are. So, you know, the dev, dev conferences and meetups and that sort of thing, and give them cards that say, you know, we'd like to hire more people just like you, and give them that tool so that they can. Are you tweeting about your company? <coughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's a huge one. Yeah, and it and it depends. I mean, if you need research scientists you know, figure out where the research scientists hang out and what do they do on their, you know, where are they going to hear your message? It's kind of marketing 101. I mean, it's a little bit of, you know, who's the audience and, and where are they when they're listening to things. But, you know, you have to think too, people usually need a nudge. Like they need someone to say, you would be really good on my team and I want to talk to you about it. Um, you know, because the most engaged people are sort of busy doing their own thing and they hear messages but they don't necessarily respond to them. So. I read a statistic way back, probably about a decade ago, about Steve Jobs and uh, the interviewer asked him, so how do you spend your day? And it came down to, I spend 25% of my time recruiting. So if it's good enough for Steve Jobs, it's, chances are it's pretty good for most of us as entrepreneurs and we probably had to spend almost 50% to get to that level. I was on, we were in San Francisco for last week for Steve Blank. Um, a lean launchpad entrepreneurs program. I ran into a guy on the train that used to work for Apple um, the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, exactly when Steve um, Jobs wasn't there. But he knew him and he was telling all these stories no about kidding. Guy Kawasaki. And that's what he said. He said, you know, Steve Jobs gets all the credit, but you know what his real strength was? Hiring the smartest yeah. people around. Mm -hmm. He said he hired brilliantly, like just the best designers and the best um, in technology. And stuff. So just to add to your yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. they said they undersell the team. They always put him as this. Yeah, but, mm -hmm. but the team was really important. It's interesting. Are we done? Is there any more uh, questions or comments, or? Mario and Christina, thank you so much. Excellent, very practical presentation. Um, the speakers will be around for a few more minutes if you want to ask them any questions individually. And our series will begin again in September. We're lining up new topics and really exciting speakers, so keep an eye on the website. We'll have the dates and registration up in the next few months, and have a great summer. Try to stay cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.